Okay, a very warm welcome to everybody to the Knowledge Series panel discussion by Moneywise Smart. I have great pleasure in introducing our guest, Mr. Vishal Khandelwal. Vishal is the founder of Safal Niveshak, one of the most widely followed blogs on value investing and behavioral finance. Uh, Vishal, if you can please uh, put the link of your blog in the chat so that people get to see it. His communication style is unique and through his blog, he has been helping a lot of people to make better investment decisions. I'm personally a huge fan of his writing. Vishal has over 18 years of experience as a stock market analyst and investor and has been an investing coach for over 10 years. And our panelists today, Vaibhav Shukla, one of our business partners at Moneywise Smart, he's based in London. He has worked in the capital market sector for nearly all his working life. He was with Citibank's Warrants and Equity Derivatives Department before establishing his own technology business in the field of electronic trading. After he sold his business, he has been managing his own family office investments out of London. And we have Fan Liang Chia, who is our co-founder of Moneywise Smart. He is an avid value investor. He spent several years with a NYSE listed consulting firm dealing with corporate finance and disputes advisory, initially based in Singapore and then as a director in the Melbourne office. Nothing excites Fan Liang more than identifying and analyzing great businesses. He's someone who can actually spend weeks trying to understand the effects of working capital dynamics and employee stock options on business valuations. I have never seen anyone analyzing businesses as thoroughly as he does. And my name is Rupam Deb. I'm the moderator for this session. I'm the co-founder of Moneywise Smart. We are an investment education and research company. Now we will start with a power packed presentation by Vishal followed by our panel discussion. And we also have some very exciting quizzes and the winners will win an autographed, uh, win autographed copies of the latest book by Vishal, which actually a few days back, uh, Connor Whitehead, uh, who is from Scotland, he won in uh, another similar quiz in uh, another uh, session of ours. And I would also welcome all our YouTube viewers who could not be present for the live session. And if I may request you to kindly take your cursor and hit the like, like button below the video and subscribe to our channel if you are not yet a subscriber. You know, it does not cost you a cent, but really helps us with the YouTube algorithm. So we will really appreciate that. And all our live viewers, please send our quest, uh, send us all your questions for the panelists through the chat window, uh, so that during the Q and A sessions we we can uh, uh, pick the questions. And without further ado, I pass on the mic to Vishal. Vishal, take it away. Thanks, Rupam, and uh, thanks uh, to your entire team for inviting me. For this session, this is uh, this is in fact the first session that I have done in the last or since COVID started in the in the post COVID area. This is the first session that I am doing. Um, I've I've done a lot of workshops, uh, investment workshops and sessions uh, over the past uh, ten years now. Uh, but uh, this is one thing which I've done after the long gap. So I'm pretty nervous about that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, the, I think the topic that you. Uh, uh, gave me was was very interesting something that's very close to me uh, investing for the long term in an era where everyone is uh, uh, thinking short term and having short term attention span so i think that's that's a very uh, uh, important topic and especially in these times when we have uh, 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 led by the coronavirus and people are at home and sports betting has actually stopped so if you've seen uh, a lot of that focus being shifted to the stock market where uh, the so-called Robin Hood traders uh, and people, very youngsters especially, right? Uh, they have taken the markets by storm and they're not fearful of losing money. They are just, uh, they just want to enjoy the game till it lasts. So uh, I think uh, in this time period, I think it's very important for us to understand, especially people who are here for the long term, that uh, uh, it's uh, value investing or investing for the long term is still, is still a game that must be played very sensibly. And very carefully because uh, uh, whatever you do, I think the most important thing that you need to uh, uh, do to really win in investing is to survive. It's not about uh, raking in high amount of growth and a quick amount of money in a short span of time. Everyone and probably everyone can do that, 
but the point is that uh, the only way you can do well over a long period of time and compound your your wealth uh, i think is by surviving so and how do you survive i think uh, by having a long term period uh, by believing in the power of compounding and by taking things seriously uh, not yourself but things seriously so um, i will uh, uh, so i need to i need to submit a question to this poll as well we know your answer i've done that <laughs> okay so i'll i'll start sharing the screen uh, rubam right yeah sure sure okay uh, so i'll just set it up once Yeah, we see it. You fine? Perfect, fine. Yes. Can can everybody see the screen? Can uh, some of you type and okay, perfect, perfect. Yes, Vishal, you're all good. Yeah, great. Uh, so uh, yeah, so long term investing in the age of short attention spans. Uh, uh, that's a topic that has been close to me, close to my heart for many years now. Especially uh, uh, given the fact that I have been a long term investor. luckily from the very start of my investment career which was almost 18 years back um uh, i i did my mba in finance uh, and uh, uh, then joined an equity research firm which was an independent equity research firm in way back in 2003 uh, and since we were independent we were not brokers we were uh, and we were catering to small retail investors uh, our focus was long term uh, our research was long term so i actually never went through the cycle of uh, trading losing money of course i lost uh, some money uh, even uh, while practicing long term investing but uh, most of it uh, was by way of uh, mistakes of commission or mistakes of omission but nothing to do with short termism right so uh, uh, something i think it's very important for uh, us to understand that investing is a long term game i think people here uh, all my thing everyone uh, understands that investing is a long term game and we must we we must play it for the long term but the fact that everyone around us is playing the short term game almost everyone uh, people are making a lot of money and especially we've seen in the last one year uh, after the crash that happened in the uh, just after covid uh, struck us i think uh, since then people have made a lot of money and uh, given the hindsight bias given that it's a perfect 2020 hindsight hindsight vision people uh, uh, i see people have become a bit arrogant uh, in the way they treat their investments and they treat how they how they invest their money um, so i think uh, it's very important it's a very important topic especially in, in, in this at this point of time um, and i thank you rupam for allowing me to speak on this so let me start uh, with a uh, with a standard disclaimer that i must i must not be solely held responsible for anything you see here today as my kids have learned to work on the powerpoint i think uh, given that we've been stuck at home and kids have been learning all new tools and techniques right so that's a standard disclaimer that i must give so uh just a second so uh this story starts in a hospital uh, uh, and i'll be telling you a few stories today so this story starts in a hospital where the relatives have gathered in the waiting room as a family member lies gravely ill and the doctor comes looking looking very tired and dull he says to the family members i'm afraid i'm the bearer of bad news the only hope left for your relative or for your loved one is a brain transplant and the relative asked how risky is the procedure they concerned how risky is the procedure and the doctor replies it's an experimental thing it's very risky but it is the only hope for your loved one insurance will cover the procedure but you have to pay for the brain and the family members sat very silently as they absorbed the news and after some time someone who was bravely asked how much will a brain cost the doctor quickly responded rupees 20 lakh for a male brain and rupees 5 lakh for a female brain now that moment was really awkward because some of the men had to try not to smile by looking at the female members who were out there and a man who was unable to control his curiosity finally asked doctor why is a male brain price so so much more than a female brain and the doctor smiled at the childish innocence and said it's just standard pricing procedure we have to price the female brain a lot lower because they have been used so um, a lot of people actually get hurt sentimentally when and especially a lot of my audience are male right uh, men 
they get hurt when they hear that a female brain prize is, 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 is priceless because it's been used. And uh, if you're a man hearing this, and I see a lot of men hearing this, please don't feel bad about what you just heard because this is a reality. And especially when you are in the, invest in the stock market, and especially when you are trying to make decisions in the midst of a bull market after already having earned large doses of effortless, effortless money. Now, we often fail to, fail to use our brains and that's priceless. Uh, resource that is given free to each human being at birth. And maybe we fail to use it because it is given free to us. Uh, scientists say that our brain weighs around three pounds, is 100,000 years old, contains 200 billion neurons, has a large cerebral cortex than most mammals, and a very highly developed visual system, a visual system. But the problem is, it is also the source of almost all of our errors in life and investing. We tend to do stupid things like smoking, not wearing seat belts, or wearing masks, and indulging in excessive stock market special speculation. These are all stupid things, even the smart brains we have. And this is despite the overwhelming evidence that these behaviors can hurt us. In fact, psychological research suggests that great intelligence, and, and the greater the intelligence is, and the more you are educated and expertise you have, you might actually end up amplifying your errors. Now consider this question that a lot of people are asked, how many animals of each species did Moses take on the ark? Can you answer? Can anyone answer how many species did Moses take on the ark? Well, the answer is zero because it was not Moses, it was Noah who was supposed to take the animals on the ark. And many intelligent people actually get this wrong because what they hear only is the ark and the animals and they forget that it's Noah and it's not Moses or not Moses who actually took animals on the ark. People are capable. So these guys who actually get it wrong, they are capable people. They are intelligent people. They have good reasoning. But the problem is most of the time we fail to apply our reasoning. We fail to apply our brain power effectively. And instead, we rely too much on our gut feelings. Just take a look at this chart. And if I may ask you, uh, uh, which is the best stock. And people make a lot of their investment decisions looking at stock prices. So if I were to ask you and people can tell me which out of these stocks would you actually like to invest in? Or people would like to invest in and really uh, uh, rave about stock price. So which is the best stock out of the three? No way to tell from the chart. Of course, yes. But that's what people do. They buy stocks looking at the stock price charts. Can't say. You have a smart audience here, Rupi. <laughs> <laughs> but people, when I when I do when I when I when I ask this question in my workshop, and a lot of people, I uh, okay, number two. Someone said number two. Someone actually gave an answer, number two. Okay. Uh, the point is, when I ask a lot of people about uh, uh, which stock do you think uh, uh, is the best one, because most people out there, you believe it or not including most of the times, most of us, we indulge in buying stocks based on the stock price charts that we see and how the stock has performed in the recent past. And when I ask this question, which is the best stock, most of the time people would say stock number three, right? That's a stock which has given, which has given a great amount of return. Okay, the one that we shall buy, is, <laughs> that's the worst stock that you should buy. Okay, so uh, uh, the answer to this question is, the first two stock price, someone answered this, the first two charts are actually these two small time periods in this stock price journey, right? Uh, in the long term, it is actually not really visible, such kind of volatility, such kind of ups and downs. When you look at long run price charts of companies which have created wealth for shareholders, such kind of volatility is not visible, right? But because we have short attention spans, because we are running after short term money, we are running after quick money, we, are, we want to make decisions quickly using our, our systems one thinking, which I'm going to cover a bit uh, in the subsequent slides, people think uh, the third stock is the best stock because it has given the best amount of returns. But you also need to look at the time frames, right? Volatility is not the risk. Volatility is never the risk. Stock prices moving up and down is never the risk for long-term investors, for serious investors. It's losing your money permanently. Charlie Munger says we do massively stupid things. Uh, and the one thing that has surprised me all my life is how many people with high IQs do massively stupid things. It happens, how extreme? 
it happens everywhere, but it's surprisingly how extreme the stupidity is and how talented the people who do who do them. Right? Mangar also says a lot of people are very smart in terms of passing tests and making rapid calculations, but they just make one asinine decision after another. Because in their quick computing minds are these terrible streaks of nothingness. Why does this happen? The question is, why does this happen? You need to blame the brain. Right? Look at this a bit on the brain. We have two important segments of the brain. First is the thinking brain, which is a neocortex, which is also known as a reflective brain. And, and, and this is the newest part of the brain, which, which has evolved over the past few thousand years. And the second is which uh, part of the brain which has evolved over like millions of years is the reflexive brain, right? Which is survival brain, which is also known as a reptilian brain because it reacts in instance. It's the it's oldest part of the brain. Now, reflexive brain, which is the oldest part of the brain, Daniel Kahneman, the behavior scientist, call this system one thinking. Right? It is fast acting, it is uncontrolled, it's effortless, associative, and unconscious portion of our brain that we use for most activities, which does not require a lot of thought. Like stock market investing, we act on reflexes. The second part of the brain that I talked about, which Daniel Kahneman says is the reflective brain or the system to thinking, is slow and controlled, it requires effort, and is deductive and self-aware. For example, when you say two into two, that's reflexive brain. When you say 25 into 35, that is reflective brain because you need to stop, you need to pause, you need to think, and you need to calculate, and then uh, you arrive at the answer rather than simply saying two is to two. Now, this part of the brain, the reflective part of the brain, helps us reduce the number of cognitive errors, right? And Kahneman associates a reflective brain with the second level thinking. When it comes to investing, when you look at stocks versus businesses, looking at stocks, like I showed that stock price chart and asked you which stock is the best. Most of the time, most of us use our system one thinking, which is a reflexive brain when we are looking at stock prices because things are moving fast, right? When it comes to looking at income statements, balance sheets, financial statements, and doing the analysis of businesses to arrive at which are good businesses and which are not worth investing in, that is where we are reflecting. That's our system two thinking. The sad part is that most of the time, while looking at stocks, while looking at investing, we are thinking from a system one perspective. We are actually reflexive, using a reflexive brain and not the reflective brain. And that is what causes us a lot of problems. In the US, there's a National Institute of Mental Health, which, which has given out a few symptoms of bipolar disorder, people having a manic episode and people having depressive episodes. If you just run down, run, run through these lists, you can see people having manic episodes have a very high up energy, elated. They have increased activity levels. They feel jumpy. They feel wired. They have trouble sleeping and things like that. On the other hand, people who are depressive, they feel often feel sad, down, empty, or hopeless. They have very little energy. They have decreased activity levels. They have they are worried, right? They feel empty. They forget things a lot. Right? Does this remind you of something? Well, the un untutored stock market investor seems to behave awfully lot like the bipolar patient. Now, they want to hop in and out of hot stocks and make quick bucks. They don't want to invest long term. Instead, to speculate and gamble for the short term. They want to quickly buy and sell, take the profits, repeat it often enough, and presumably get rich. This is what happens. And Ben Graham's manic, aggressive Mr. Market was a bipolar person. And Graham himself wrote in his book, is Mr. Market bipolar? Yes, he is, right? That is how you associate what happens in stock markets with people with bipolar disorder. Like Marilyn Monroe, who said, I'm selfish, impatient, and a little insecure. I make mistakes. I am out of control at, at times and hard to handle. But if you can't handle me at my worst, then you sure as hell don't deserve me at my best. Right? Now you replace Marilyn Monroe with Mr. Market and the message does not change. If you cannot handle the market and your stocks at their worst, then you sure as hell don't deserve them at their best. Blaise Pascal said, the mind of man at one and the same time is both the glory and the shame of the universe. Right? And that's exactly right. Our mind has this enormous power as we understood. However, it also has these standard malfunctions it often causes it to reach wrong conclusions. It also makes us extraordinarily subject to manipulation by others. And we see this 
happening so often in the stock market on a daily basis. Just look at Hitler, roughly half of the army of Adolf Hitler was composed of believing Catholics. And you see how he manipulated people. With over 18 plus years of experience in the stock market and managing my money now, I can say with confidence that this psychological stuff is very important as far as investing is concerned. Pascal also said, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Right? That is a problem that plagues us in all the, all, all the areas of life, and especially in investing. We just don't have the ability to sit quietly in a room alone doing nothing. We have to do something. And that do something syndrome actually causes us a lot of problems as far as investing is concerned. A few years ago, uh, in the city of uh, uh, Monza, Italy, uh, people were barred from keeping goldfish in curved bowls. And the authorities, authorities said that they want to do that because it is cruel to keep a fish in a bowl with a curved side because gazing out, the fish would have a distorted view of reality. Now, the question is, how do we know we have the true undistorted picture of reality as humans? We were talking about attention spans. The attention span of human beings is getting shorter and shorter. A while ago, researchers did a study and found that it is now shorter than that of a goldfish. A goldfish has supposedly has an attention span of nine seconds. Humans now have an attention span of eight seconds on an average. Right? By the way, if you pass through this uh, presentation without looking at your mobile phone, congratulations. You have a much higher attention span. And thank you for that. I think the problem in a nutshell is that we suffer from what we call as IADD, which is, which is, which is a short form for investor attention deficit disorder. We know of ADD, now this is IADD, which is not a recognized medical condition, as you know. If you know somebody who suffers from IADD, you will know that they struggle to establish a, a robust and coherent investment strategy and that they do highly irrational things such as buying shares in, say, Alibaba just because they attended a dinner party last night where the host toasted to Alibaba saying it is the next Amazon, right? So almost everyone suffers from IADD and that's, that's the biggest problem. Now the issue with IADD and short attention spans that we are paying a high financial price for the same. Information overload is giving us little time to focus on any of it and leading us to make bad choices about our money. We are always multitasking or moving from one bit of information to the, to the next. Right? And we rarely look at one piece of information long enough to fully digest it. All this has one crucial side effect. It creates a shortage of attention, which can lead to poor financial choices. Now, when it comes to our money, effective decision-making typically, typically requires information concentration and reflection, one of the most important things, which is a reflection. Not so long ago, the main scarcity that we had as investors and people was information. We lacked the data to make informed financial decisions. But now we are drowning in data. We, what we lack instead is the ability to properly process it. The price we, we pay for what, what that may be subtle, but it's hardly insignificant. This is what attention deficit syndrome does to us. You look at the average holding period of stocks, and this is American data from the NYSE Pack book. In 1960, it was 100 months. In 2010, it was six months, and, and I'm sure it, it is much lower now. This is, this is what an average holding period of stocks is, and this is what cause, is causing us a lot of problems. People for many, many years have, have learned and, 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 and have been educated in the, in the principle of long-term investing, and they've seen the benefits of long-term investing. Despite that, the, the average holding period for stocks has been coming down gradually, rapidly after that, right? Six months to two years. Okay, I see the statistics. Average holding period of your portfolio, six months to two years, is the majority. But of course, there are people who also hold for more than five years. I think together combined, they are they are slightly bigger than people who hold only for six months to two years. That's that's good to know. That's good to know. I told you you have a good crowd. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm managing two screens, so I'm sorry for uh, interrupting you a bit. Okay. Uh, two 
forget attention uh, span shorting i think uh, even uh, for the time that we are spending in the stock markets uh, we are not doing the right things right uh, these, this is a chart which i made some time back about how we spend most of our time uh, uh, in the stock markets we are indulging in useless information we are busy envying others who are making money fast we are cloning and copying others mindlessly we are predicting the future we are fearing missing out the fomo effect most of the time we are also regretting our past mistakes we are avoiding accepting that we made mistakes and we are denying the reality especially when it's harsh right and there's so little time that we actually spend in actual investing this is which is researching stocks doing the hard work uh, uh, understanding management quality and understanding valuations which 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 combine to form a proper process that i'm going to talk about a bit uh, uh, in this presentation i think that's the shortest amount of time that we spend on the most important things investing uh, uh, and this is a problem aside of the shortening investor attention span i think so we have a great problem at hand right we all know the problem that we are suffering from the problem is our brain does not allow us to actually indulge in real time uh, hard hard investing or or simple investing which is actually the way to go to create wealth for the long term but the point is that the more we understand that other things that we are we are doing wrong the more we understand the mistakes that our brains lead us to i think the more we will be able to minimize these mistakes i we can never eliminate the mistakes of behavior and investing is 99% behavior we can never eliminate them but all we can aim for is to minimize them and i think that's a task well done just look at the financial markets i was talking about financial markets now an activity that people have historically pursued in isolation which is investing buying and selling stocks and other assets has become the hottest way to socialize right friends get together on zoom and this is something that i found out recently friends get together on zoom to live trade stocks just as they watch movies or tv together on netflix or amazon prime trading website leaderboard show the names and gains of the people making the most money and you see all those people coming on twitter as well and posting about how much money they have made through trading in the last one week now you have brokerage apps who display list of stocks that users have talking to the most so you know how do you um, the kind of people you want to clone and you clone for the short term you copy blindly copy and paste for the short term and all this has gotten millions of novices over the fear of managing their own money and showing that investing does not have to be deadly done it has given people something to talk about other than politics and the pandemic unfortunately when investing turns into socializing it also turns dangerous look at this guy one of the most honest people i have seen huh, uh, on twitter of late uh this guy is danny tran and uh, 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 jason zweig uh, the wall street journal columnist and editor of uh, Ben Graham's intelligent investor. He he wrote it. He wrote in an article recently uh, about this guy who said, "I don't know what I am doing." He said, uh, "Danny Tran." He said, "The guy you see in the picture." Uh, I just know I'm making money, and he added that he'd been trading stocks for only three days, but just like that, he made three hundred dollars for the day, right? And then in the weeks after this video was released, Danny Tran racked up almost five hundred thousand followers on TikTok. Now the coronavirus has unleashed, as I mentioned, a new generation. of gamblers on the stock market people mainly young men going stir crazy from quarantine and the lack of professional sports to bet on they have turned into trading stocks to so these thrill seekers the magnitude of moves matter as much as the direction and a big loss can be as much fun as a big gain so we are in dangerous territories right it's very important not to uh, go with the tide because most investors the more people in the stock markets especially the youngsters as i mentioned are all in the tide they think they are rising because of the skills but as someone said often it is the sea which is rising and not you as a tide daniel kahneman he says something very nice he says a human being is a dark and weird thing and whereas the hair has seven skins the human being can shed seven times 70 skins and still not be able to say this is really you this is no longer out of the shell so said nizer and fraud agreed we are ignorant of ourselves most of the time in investing we are ignorant of ourselves and just to quote adam smith george goodman who said if you don't know who you are this is an expensive place to find out and i recommend this book the money game one of the best books on 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 how stock markets evolve and how people behave in the stock markets uh, uh, adam smith is the pen name of george uh, goodman who is the author of this book 
and something which is very important. If you don't know who you are, stock markets are an expensive place to find out and people have found out in the past. Charlie Munger says, I did not succeed in life by intelligence. I succeeded because I had a long attention span. Buffett calls him a five second person, but that five second is, is the way he makes decisions in terms of thinking through the process in five seconds. But it's not that this person has a long attention, a short attention span. You've seen uh, the success that Buffett and Munger and company has, has, has earned over decades and decades, not years and years, but decades and decades of investing their money and people's money, right? only because they have had a long-term perspective. Of course, apart from the inherent intelligence, the thing that has worked uh, to the advantage of Buffett and Munger is, is, is the long-term, uh, long attention span, holding on to good quality businesses for long-term. And of course, their age, age, time on their hand. Now, the question is, we've talked about short attention spans, which is something that is very difficult to change because humans are humans, right? We have, our brains have evolved, our thinking and evolved over millions, thousands and millions of years. So we cannot change that in a short span of time, in a short span of lifetime that we have. So uh, we cannot do anything about the, the, the short attention spans that we have. And we also understand the benefits of long-term investing. So things have been taken care of. But the question is, what do we need to do to invest for the long-term to benefit despite the short attention spans that we have, right? It's, it's, it's impossible to beat our systems one thinking. And, and system one thinking, which is a reflexive, reflexive thinking, often saves us from dangers, right? Uh, it can cause us problem in the stock market, but it saves us from dangers in life. Uh, but the point is that if we can understand how do we get over most of the mistakes of system one thinking, reflexive thinking, short attention span, I think uh, uh, we'll do well for ourselves uh, uh, as far as wealth creation is concerned. So the first thing you need to do, uh, and we all need to do, is pause and reflect, right? Unlike people, unlike the TikTok investors, unlike the Robin Hood traders who have no time to pause and reflect, they are because they're just earning money. They're busy earning money till the game continues, right? We need to pause and reflect. And I, and I read a story some time back um, in a book, uh, uh, The Knowledge Illusion, uh, where the author uh, wrote about a goon uh, who was causing a nuisance for a shopkeeper. Now, he would spray paint abusive and derogatory graffiti all over his store wall to get over this. One day, he waited, finished his dirty work, and then he paid the goon $100 to thank him for his effort. The following day, the goon came again, but the shopkeeper paid him only $50 for the graffiti. And that was all derogatory graffiti. But the shopkeeper paid, paid him money. He continued to pay the goon to deface his property, but the amount kept decreasing. Soon the goon was getting only $10 and he stopped coming. <laughs> Why bother doing all that work to abuse a shopkeeper for so little money? <laughs> right? And the author of this book, The Knowledge Illusion, where I read, where I read the story, he writes, this tale, this story is about what causes people to act and how you can modify their motivations to make them think they are doing something for a different reason than they initially thought. You could argue that the goon initially had the motivation for derogatory graffiti and the clever shopkeeper subtly replaced his intrinsic motivation with an extrinsic incentive, which is money. And when that external reward dwindled, like it would happen for these short-term traders and robin Hood traders, I'm sure it's a matter of time, the goon did not have a reason to continue his work. So when people who come into the stock markets thinking that's the fast way of making money and they, they actually make money rapidly in a short span of time and, and, and they see others around them making a lot of money. It's, it's like that money that the shopkeeper paid to that goon for, derogate, for, for putting that derogatory gra graffiti. And when the, the returns come down, when the markets crash and the, and the rewards come down, these are the people who run away first from the stock market, never to come back. Right? That's, that's, how we, that's, how, that's how do you change the motivation from, from, from extrinsic to intrinsic. Right, and and that is the reason it calls for pausing and reflecting and examining what exactly you are doing in the stock market rather than just trying to earn money. Frank Partnow, who's written a wonderful book called Weight and the Art of Science and Delay, he says life might be a race against time, but it is enriched when we rise above our instincts and stop the clock to process and understand what we are doing and why. A wise decision requires reflection, and reflection requires a pause. It requires a pause. Now, this story, uh, uh, which I just shared about the goon and the shopkeeper, it's a great reminder.
stars or how we are investing our money like as an investor it is a good idea to slow down and reflect on these questions very important questions am i investing the way that suits my temperament or am i guided by what others around me are doing are there pockets of my investing time that are being spent doing meaningless graffiti which is same as speculating on investments i have no idea about instead of spending understanding businesses worth investing in without proper examination of how you are investing and spending your time as an investor you may fall into the abyss of mindless action and by practicing examined investing by pausing by reflecting on the decision that you are trying to make you will get a sense of clarity and thus a lot of peace with the process so that's the first thing that you need to do that to pause and reflect if you want to get over the short attention span and create wealth for yourself over the long term point number 2 is to you, it's very important to guard your brain attic and here i bring to you sherlock holmes uh, the author of sherlock holmes series arthur conan doyle uh, he wrote this first novel a study of scarlet where he introduced sherlock holmes for the first time and uh, uh, that is where watson sherlock holmes uh, partner and friend actually describes what holmes is about and something uh, uh, that really uh, surprised me uh, uh, while reading this novel was when watson says that sherlock holmes ignorance was as remarkable as his knowledge ignorance is talking about ignorance and according to watson holmes knew next to nothing uh, about literature philosophy and politics and he was also ignorant of the copernican theory and of the composition of the solar system which means sherlock holmes did not know that the earth travel around the sun and while watson was trying to get handle on such ignorance of his otherwise genius friend holmes replied now that i do know it i shall do my best to forget it now after this in in the in the novel a study of scarlet there is something that sherlock holmes tells watson which is very important about how he treated his own brain and why he was so particular about what got into it and it's very important for us to understand what sherlock holmes actually advised he told watson this i consider that a man's brain originally is like a little empty attic and you have to stock it with such furniture as you choose a fool a fool takes in all the lumber of every sort that he comes across so that the knowledge which might be useful to him gets crowded out or at best is jumbled up with a lot of other things so that he has a difficulty in laying his hands upon it now the skillful workman is very careful indeed as to what he takes into his small brain attic he will have nothing but the tools which may help him in doing his work but of these he has a large assortment and all in all in the most perfect order it is a mistake to think that little room which is the brain has elastic walls and can distend to any extent depend upon it there comes a time when for every addition of knowledge you forget something that you knew before it is of the highest importance therefore not to have useless facts elbowing out useful ones so sherlock holmes actually equated the human brain with an empty attic you need to take in the most important things not the news that we talk about when we are talking about stock markets uh, rolf dobelli another favorite author of mine says that news is to the mind that sugar is to the body i think it's very important to get over the noise and that noise that we all surrounded by 24 by 7 is actually one of the biggest reasons for us to have reduced attention spans nate silver uh, uh, author he says if the quantity of information by if the quantity of information by 2.5 quintillion bytes per day the amount of useful information almost certainly is it most of it is just noise and the noise is increasing faster than the signal there are so many hypotheses to test so many data set to mine but relatively constant amount of subjective truth there's little amount of truth which is out there where we hear about in news and information and the books that we read most of that is noise and it's very important in today's world to get over that noise if you want to make sensible investment decision despite the noise all around Nassim Taleb says a considerable jump in my personal health has been achieved by removing offensive irritants the morning newspapers the boss the daily commute air conditioning television economic forecast news about the stock markets which means to simplify our life in investing it's very important to subtract things right we have limited time limited capacity to think it's very important to subtract things which Taleb talks about by the concept of why a negative are in his book anti fragile I drew this chart some time back, which talks about the happiness curve, 
and the art of subtraction this this chart actually relates to most of the things that we do in life um, and just to simplify it by the time we are in the middle age which is like 40 45 years of age we are actually in the accumulation phase we are adding a lot of things to our life we are making a life complexes we want stuff we want more things we want to uh, buy bigger houses we want more stocks in our portfolio fatter salary checks and all the things that we can accumulate till we are 40 45 years of age where the mid life crisis hits us and after that we are in the subtraction space because we understand that not, none of this makes sense right or most especially most of this does not make sense and so we are in the subtraction phase and that is where and that is why the happiness curve actually bottoms uh, in the mid life and it peaks it it increases or the happiness levels increase as we move ahead in age of course if we are disease free i think that's one of the most important things so uh, subtracting noise subtracting things subtracting stocks which are not worth investing in from your life subtracting the uh, uh, idea of trading in and out of stocks right uh, uh, not acting all the time uh, are some of the ways we can reduce the overload load on our brain we can uh, improve our attention spans and we can we can improve our long term investment track record uh a bit on the reading spectrum uh, before i moved ahead, move ahead uh, uh, this is something which i do sometime back again as well uh, moving from ephemeral which are short term things or things that actually don't matter in terms of what i read to the enduring stuff which is which is the matter that that i read and reread and And, and my advice to people, especially who are into investing and thinking and decision making, to 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 read, I think more and more of enduring stuff and leave out the ephemeral stuff by the side. Newspapers are ephemeral; you don't get anything uh, uh, meaningful uh, except noise and information when you are reading newspapers. And I don't read newspapers. Uh, some of magazines, more of blogs, uh, a bit more of newly published books. Uh, then I read most of the time. I I re I'm reading widely read books, biographies, and super texts. and uh, there's a whole list which is out there which i think uh, uh, to to get share uh, later uh, with the audience but the point is that uh, uh, we need to be spending more most of our time uh, doing enduring stuff not just investing even the kind of things that we are putting into our brain as which sherlock holmes uh, calls the little empty attic we need to be putting that brain or filling that brain with the most important enduring stuff um, and not be noise if we are to make sensible investment decision and this is all part of making sensible decisions in investing in life uh, that we are not actually crowding out the important things from our brain by ingesting all that unnecessary stuff which media news newspapers 24 by 7 smartphone provides us i think just get over it and i think you'll be fine the third way you can uh, uh, work around your investment and uh, work towards creating wealth uh, over the long term despite reducing attention span is is to seize your obsession to control things right uh, we do not know the future much less control it we like to think we do control the future but that never turns out to be true and yet we continue to believe in the illusion of control our attempts to control the world can be seen through how we try to control how our children turn out as if we can shape them like blocks of clay the illusion also shows up when we try to track every little thing from spending to exercise to heart rate to what we eat to what tasks we do to how many visitors are on the website to how the stock market is doing today as if our selective tracking can possibly include the many complex factors that influence outcomes now control as i mentioned is an illusion and it's very important for us to overcome this illusion and how do you do that first by being aware of it that you suffer from illusion of control right when you buy stocks when people buy stocks they think that they control the outcome and they already imagine a great track record over the next few years right that is a, a very common feeling for investors when you buy stocks you think that you made the right decision and you you control the destiny of the company and the stock which is not true so it's very important for us to first accept that we suffer from illusion of control so that we are much more aware about it and then we need to be 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 uh, we need to be open to the possibility of being wrong i think keeping aside the uh, ego uh, uh, while investing in stock market accepting failures which is a part of the process and understanding and accepting uh, the the point that we don't control the outcomes right uh, whether they are good outcomes or bad outcomes we, we don't often control most of the outcome we control the actions that we take we control the decision that we make and not the outcomes right i think it's these are very important steps that we need to take to get over our obsession 
to control which is a great enabler in the way you or it's a great enabler in how you can uh, do well uh, uh, and safely with your stocks over the long term things that you control this i think very few things that you control and one of the most important things is how much you save and how much you invest right there are 50000 books written on on personal finance investing but there's only one single rule that you need to be uh, spending less than you earn and you need to invest that money gradually keep on investing uh, sensibly and little by little over a period of time a little will become a lot right that's that yellow portion that you see here is is what compounding does to your money over a long period of time right this compounding over a long period of time um uh, and that that is something that is in our control i think uh, uh, most of the time right uh, and if we can work on uh, uh saving and investing well and keeping the money rather than losing it through speculation i think i think uh, and uh, that's a way to survival and i think uh, as peter bernstein once said i think survival is the road to which is there's no other road to which is in stock market investing it is it is it is survival the fourth way uh, we can deal with shortening attention spans is to think in terms of eternity spinoza the dutch philosopher he said subspecie eternity which was in aspects of eternity and i first uh, came to know about uh, spinoza and and this quotation is when i was watching a video on ben graham a few years back where one of his student marshall weinberg uh, he said that the biggest lesson he drew out of ben graham's class was on long term thinking and he said marshall weinberg said he said one sentence changed my life ben graham opened the course by saying if you want to make money in wall street you must have the proper psychological attitude no one expresses it better than spinoza the philosopher when he said that i nearly jumped out of my course what i suddenly looked up and he said and i remember exactly what he said he said spinoza said you must look at things in the aspect of eternity and that's what suddenly hooked me to ben graham now here was a father of value investing teaching his students about the value of long term thinking and that too in terms of eternity now almost 7 8 decades later we would be paying true homage to ben graham if we could view investing through a wide angle lens zooming out taking a long term perspective and striving for a long sustained upward trend in our stocks instead of getting worried about the short term volatility in stock prices this may not help us eliminate all mistakes we make as investors but it can give us the tool to treat our investments much better much better fidelity uh, and i'm sure people would have come to know about the study fidelity one of the biggest fund managers in the us they studied uh their clients performance their own clients performance between 2003 and 2013 the 10 year track record of how fidelity's own clients did during this 10 year period the second best batch of clients of fidelity who did the best were the guys who forgot they had accounts with fidelity right they were clients but they forgot that they had account with fidelity and the guys who did the best were the guys who had account with fidelity who were customers of fidelity but were dead right so uh, these guys were clients of fidelity but were dead so there was no way for them to call their account managers and relationship managers and ask them to speculate in stock prices right so people who were dead actually made better decisions and earned much greater return than people who were alive of course you don't need to die to make good investment decisions but the i think you get the point right it's it's inactivity i'm talking about it's long term inactivity of course i'm not saying buying some things and forgetting about it it's by long term investing is not about buy and forget it's about buying reviewing and then deciding uh, often if you have made the right decision never to sell those investments right if the things are doing fine so uh actual investments and by fidelity clients actually proves this another good book i think uh, but it suffers a lot from hindsight bias 100 to 1 in the stock market uh, thomas wells the author says to make money in stocks you must have the vision to see them the courage to buy them and the patience to hold them patience of course is the rarest of the three but it pays off in the long run that's how fortunes are made in the stock market this is a this is a snapshot which i took from warren buffett's 2017 letter where he shows actually four time periods where berkshire hathaway stock fell more than 30 40 50% you can see a uh, uh, 70s 59% down right uh, 87 in 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 actually 25 days the stock was down 37% then during the dot com crash the stock was down 49% and in 2008 9 of course the last major crash that we saw before the corona virus crash 51% down despite four situations of four uh, time period when the stock was down 30 40 50% uh, 
over the last 55 60 years the stock has still done 21% so people who did not fret who owned the stock but did not fret about such kind of falls right actually made a 21% CAGR and you know what 21% CAGR is look at the overall gain over a, over a 45 or a 50 55 years period which is a 2.4 million percentage uh, of course uh, these are uh, returns which which are not uh, which i think are almost impossible in today's world to earn and especially over a people can earn it over a 10 year period but over a 55 60 year or 5 6 decades i think these are impossible returns in today's world to earn but uh, the point uh, buffett is trying to make is uh, if the business remains good, right? Uh, and of course, he's not talking directly about his own business, except the stock price. But the lesson that he gives us, if the business remains good, right? Uh, whatever the people around you are doing, I think uh, you just need to hold on to it, right? Think of, when you're thinking yourself as a business owner, right? There's, there's nothing called as overpriced stock. There is no, nothing called call as a, a, a multi-bagger stock or a stock has become overpriced or I need to sell it before it falls down. Uh, an owner does not think like that, right? An owner just holds on to his business or his shares in the business till the time he wants to run the business, he wants to own the business, and the business does well for him or for the stakeholders. He will not really buy in and out of the uh, of the business, right? Uh, so we as investors, uh, despite the attention spans uh, uh, and the short-termism all around, if we can think, if we can not just think if you can act long term right uh, i think that's that that that's a complete 180 degree turn in the way we uh, are going to perform uh, over a long period of time and that's a that's thinking long term is actually is the only uh, uh, moat if i were to use a term that you as an investor have there's no other moat right uh, you cannot analyze things better than a fund manager you don't have more information than a fund manager or or a, or, a, or a big investor but the most important mode that you have or competitive advantage that you have over other big, especially bigger investors is the time horizon because you are accountable to no one. You don't have to uh, uh, respond to an investment committee every day or every month or every quarter. It's your money. You manage it over a long period of time sensibly and you do well. The fifth important uh, uh, way to beat the shortening of attention span is to believe in the process. And this is one of my favorite charts. Uh, Four things that we uh, control risk, how much risk we take, how much cost we incur, how much time we have and how we behave, right? And the thing that we don't control is the return that we earn on the stock or the investment. The irony is that things that we control are the things that we rarely focus on. And the thing that we don't control, which is a return, is the thing that we always focus on, right? So if we can focus on things that we control most of the time, which is the risk, cost, time and behavior, and forget about the return because uh, uh, I think over a long period of time, return should take care of themselves. And often they take care of themselves if we do things right over a long period of time. I think uh, uh, that 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 serves your that should serve your purpose as well. Uh, just an example of a stock, uh, a hot stock in India a few years back. Uh, that's a wind energy company. The stock was up three times in two years, and uh, this was the time I was working as an analyst. And so I think the two thousand seven eight time period. Uh, wind energy and power sector was doing well, especially in the stock markets. And a lot of people made a lot of money in the stock. And a lot of uh, people I, around, I, I saw boasting about how they multiplied the money quickly in a short span of time. And this is what happened three times in two years and then 99% down after, after that sharp surge. And people who stayed invested have lost everything, right? So again, this is in hindsight. But the point is that uh, if you know that the business is inherently bad, right? Uh, if you know that the fundamentals are inherently bad, right? Uh, yeah. You can only count on luck to earn you three times in two years or what kind of money. It's not your skill. It's it's completely luck. And as I mentioned, great outcomes, whether you make a lot of money, right? Great outcomes do not mean that the decision was great, right? And a bad outcome does not mean that a decision was bad. Right? People make mistakes, that's perfectly fine, but you cannot equate a great outcome. You cannot do a reverse calculation here that I earned a lot of money, which means my decision would have been right. No, your decision could have been horrible and still you could have made a lot of money. But it's, it's for that, in, for the understanding that you need to have that required humility, you need to keep your ego aside, you need to 
believe that there's something called as luck, which plays a huge role, huge role in investing. And that is the way you do well uh, by focusing on the process. So I give an example of this Spanish national lottery, uh, uh, which runs in Spain in 17, I think in the 1700s. And the first prize paid out uh, around Euro 4 million in 2011. The winner had hunted for a ticket. So this is a story. I think this is a real life story. The winner had hunted for a ticket with the last two digits as 48. And he found the ticket, he bought it, and then he won the lottery. When someone asked why he was so intent on finding that number, he replied, before buying the ticket, I dreamed of the number seven for seven straight nights. And you know, seven times seven is 48. Right? So, guy dreamed seven times seven. He knew it was 48. He bought ticket number 48. He won the lottery and he thought it was his skill and not the luck that earned him so, so much amount of money. And this happens often in stock markets. A lot of people think seven times seven is 48. They make a lot of money and they, pay. they thought it was their skill and not luck that actually helped them earn that kind of return in a short span of time. So, you can, you can be lucky even when you're dumb. Right? And you don't have a process. But a great outcome does not always mean that the decision was good. In investing a bad decision, especially one that is not based on any process, can have disastrous and often has disastrous consequences. Another story uh, which I read recently, it was a, about a giant ship that uh, whose engine had actually failed. I'm not talking about the one that blocked the Suez Canal, uh, uh, but uh, a giant ship engine failed and the ship's owners tried one expert after another, but none of them could figure out how to fix the engine. Then they brought an old man who had been fixing ships since he was a young boy, he carried out a large bag of tools with him and when he arrived, he immediately went to work. He inspected the engine very carefully, top to bottom. Two of the ship owners were there watching this man, hoping he would know what to do. After looking things over, the old man reached into his bag and pulled out a small hammer. He gently tapped something. Instantly, the engine lurched into life. He carefully put his hammer away the engine was fixed. A week later, the owners received a bill from the old man for $10,000. The owners were worried. $10,000, he hardly did anything. And so they wrote back to the old man with a note saying, please send us an itemized bill. And the man sent a bill that read, tapping with the hammer, $2, knowing where to tap, $9,998. So knowing where to tap, which is the process, is what makes all the difference, right? Whether you are working with a hammer or you're working with the money. And a good investing process boils down to three things. High quality business. We all understand this chart. I'm just running through it again. High quality business, people or management quality that you want to associate with, and a price that provides sufficient margin of safety, which means business, people, price, right? That is a good investing process in whatever market you are. This is a way of creating wealth from stocks over a long period of time. People can do different things. They can do short-term trading. They can do uh, speculation. They can do options. They can do so many things in stock market. But the way with lowest amount of least amount of stress over a long period of time, something that is uh, achievable and accessible for most investors out there, I think is, is uh, simple investing, investing into high quality businesses over a long period of time. Like this is what has helped make so many investors uh, wealthy, right? And I'm not talking talking about pure luck. I'm talking about people who have created wealth for themselves. You, you, you may, I'm not about Buffett here. You may have known of so many other investors around you who have done similar kind of things with least amount of stress over a long period of time. And that is what a good investing process falls down to, something that allows you to create wealth with the least amount of stress. A story of a boy, I'm sure a lot of people know this boy who, who at age 10 read a book titled 1000 Ways to Make $1,000, right? Which started with the story of money. He told this boy how to make it first $1,000 and then if he grew at 10% a year, it would magically turn to $1,600 in five years, $2,600 in 10 years and $10,800 in 25 years. The way these numbers exploded as they grew at a constant rate over time was how a small sum of money could turn into fortune numbers compounding as big ball grew when he rolled it down. Or long, long term compounding when he was 10 years of age. Now, as, as, as you've seen in Buffett's magic, it's simple. 
simple math mathematics when you allow your money to grow right when money makes of course with due amount of mistakes right but you can benefit from the power of compound interrupt it unnecessarily and there's a lot of news noise all around which causes us markets ups and downs right attention spans people making money here and there people losing money here and there which which leads us to interrupt our compounding machine unnecessarily i think if we can stop doing that and let the compounding train run through its course right i think that's that's something that uh, is required for wealth creation uh, you may have heard of the story of ann shiber as well ann shiber was 51 years old when she was retired it's a old story this lady was 51 years of age when she retired from a job as a low level auditor from the american internal revenue service in 1944 she never earned a salary of more than 4000 per year and although she was an exemplary worker uh she never received a promotion maybe because she was a woman and a jew the lots that were discriminated against in in that part of the world in general during that period as per the executor of her will benjamin clark shiber who had who was already investing her small savings in the stock market when she retired in 1944 started her post retirement life with a portfolio of about $21000 so when this lady retired in 1951 she had a portfolio despite her small income which was like and thanks to her savings she had built a small portfolio of $21000 which adjusted for inflation in today's dollars will be around $300000 right which is of course a lot of money to retire in it is not a not a big sum of money to retire in the us even now so this lady uh, she was alone she was uh, 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 not promoted uh, not got a big salary very with a tiny salary for a long period of time uh, and despite that she saved money and she uh, retired with 21000 dollars in uh, uh, 1944 um uh, we 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 know this uh, and shiber survived till age 101 right 101 retired at 51 801 portfolio death was 22 million dollars a lady who started with 21000 dollars when she was 51 benefited from a long life she survived another 50 years and she earned 22 million dollars she had 22 million dollars when she died in 1990 in 2000 right where did ann get all that money right 20 21000 dollars becoming 22 million dollars in 50 years what was the secret it was simple simple mathematics her 21000 dollars earned 50 15% CAGR over 50 years and became 22 million dollars nothing else of course there a lot of story lot of things about ann which you don't want to have in your life like she like she she was a lonely fellow she she did not change her apartment she often went out of home of course most of us would not do that or would not want a life like that but the point is that uh, here is a woman who actually proved that you don't need to be one buffet to uh, uh, to earn great amount of or create huge amount of wealth over a long period of time you can benefit from, from the power of compounding with little intelligence but a long term perspective so and secret was letting her humble savings enjoy 50 years of hands of compounding in the stock market that was it and the three heroes of and story were frugality longevity and compound interest living a frugal life something which is in our control longevity of course is not in our control right because you you never know till when you are if you going to survive but still if you believe that you are in reasonably good health then you can you can make good decisions for the next 20 30 40 years i think that's a long enough time to get well and of course then you let you just let the mathematics of compound interest work for you right you can you can and an important lesson is you can you can build wealth from investing over the long term without doing anything crazy i think that's a classic example jeff bezos says how do you achieve great things in life just lengthen your time horizon Uh, in an interview said that everything you do needs to work on a three year time horizon then you complete of course he was talking about businesses but that's the same thing which applies to investing if everything that you do in investing you're working from a short term time horizon then you are competing against a lot of people but if you are thinking in terms of or acting in terms of a long term horizon which may be like 10 years 20 years 30 years right then you are competing against almost no one because no one is investing or very few people are investing for that kind of a time horizon and that allows you not to fall for the trap of uh, attention spans that allows you to let your money compound over a long period of time without getting worried undue worry about about the news flows and the information and noise which is which is all around bill gates says most people overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years
one of the final charts which 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 actually capture how you can beat short term attention spans is is a way to become an investing buddha and there are the iron rules iron rules iron rule number 1 is to have zero debt right you don't you invest your own money you don't really borrow right that's that's a way to peaceful investing satisfying which is which is aiming for adequate like ben graham said in his definition for of investment you need to satisfy be satisfied with adequate return not super normal return and capital preservation is the key horizon need to be long so that you are not worried about short term news flows you are not worried about uh, what's happening in the stock market on a daily basis uh, you need to have the right kind of mental framework you are not in the stock markets uh, uh, to make quick money but as a means to achieve realistic financial goals and you need to be willing to accept mistakes and fix them right and of course three iron rules of investing or anything that we do in life detachment acceptance and peace right you need to be detached from the outcome willingness to hold cash right uh, a lot of people uh, want to be fully invested which is perfectly fine but i think uh, cash has a value so if you are not finding opportunities if you are owning if you if you are not finding reasonable opportunities to invest for long term whether it's business quality or whether it's valuations uh, it's a good idea to hold some cash to wait for the right kind of opportunities right ability to ignore noise i think one of the most important things not reading newspapers not watching a lot of or not watching any business tv not being on whatsapp groups and these are these are all ways that have emerged over the last few years of of uh, actually reducing attention spans even more uh, 24 by 7 buzzing of smartphones uh, business media at right? newspapers were all always there i think uh, uh, online conferences not like this one <laughs> but uh, online trading uh, stuff and all those kind of things uh, are actually hurting us uh, the way we behave as investors equanimity one of the great skills or the great behaviors that you can practice across all markets right across uh, different kind of markets just being equanimous where the markets are moving up and down because as someone said this too shall pass right and just enjoying the game working with an inner score card learning from mistakes and don't not aiming to beat anybody at it right your your aim as an investor i think most people uh, and and this this is something that we see often these days most people are there to play the game to beat someone right they have no idea who they want to beat but they have to beat someone right so uh, uh, investing is not a game of beating some someone right it's it's just a way of creating wealth for yourself to uh, uh, create a good purchasing power to meet uh, to meet your financial goals in the future right uh, there's no other way it's not a casino right if you think it's a casino then you are going to lose because in the casino in the long term the house always wins as they say right in the stock markets in the long term right you are going to win with a great probability i'm not saying certainty with a great amount of probability if people pay uh, play the game uh, sensibly i think they can they can achieve good respectable outcomes over a long period of time charlie munger says the only way to win win is to work 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 we can have to have a few insights he's not talking about having a lot of insights i, I think that reduces our workloads a lot when people are running from one idea to another they're searching for one idea to another i think have aim to have very few insights but work hard for them i think and just hold on to those ideas till the time they remain good ideas i think uh, that's a that's a that's a simple stress free way of investing your money over a long period of time uh lord krishna uh, said uh, told arjuna in on the battlefield of kurukshetra focus on the karma and don't let the fruit be the purpose of your of your karma karma means action focusing on your investment process and not the outcome should be your goal that is the way you can win over a short attention span and here is the payoff over the long term a good process delivers highly desirable results and generates better and more reliable outcomes even in the face of our reducing attention span and now this is this is not any secret so focus on the process i think uh, uh, leave the noise aside uh, and uh, invest with an inner score card i think these are some of the most important ideas that i would like to leave you with uh, uh, as i as i uh, come to the end of my presentation so thank you so much for listening um, rupam uh, mentioned that i can uh, just uh, introduce uh, uh, my book to you so uh, uh, without trying to oversell this is a, a book which i published recently uh, a sketchbook of wisdom so as you see i i i showed a lot of uh, illustrations uh, in my presentation so a sketchbook of wisdom is something which i have uh, 
literally handcrafted uh, over the past uh, few months, uh, and this is now in a book format, uh, which uh, I think uh, so uh, it contains like just to be very specific, it contains fifty ideas. Uh, from and timeless ideas from Krishna to Charlie Munger, Socrates to Warren Buffett, Lao Tzu to Nassim Taleb, Swami Vivekananda to Steve Jobs, and Gandhi to Nabil Ravikar, as they apply to our lives today. So, there are 50 ideas on living, decision making, investing, money uh, that can uh, help anyone who reads it. So, that's a book uh, that I self published recently and already uh, sold almost 1700 copies, including a lot in many in Singapore. So uh, good people out there. So uh, that's it. I think uh, I come to the end of my presentation. If there's any question, I'll be happy to answer. Amazing. amazing. Thank you so much. Amazing. So uh, guys, let's uh, keep the question answer session for the end. So if you have any questions, uh, you know, for Vishal or for the panelists, uh, so please uh, type the questions in the chat and uh, you know this is uh, fantastic now uh, let's see a show of hands uh, this book is clearly a collector's item now we have a we have a way of uh, making sure that you can get this book absolutely free of cost so who wants to uh, win this book free of cost just uh, okay Awesome. So, so a lot of people. Okay. So let's have some fun, uh, you know, before we start the panel discussion. So we have a couple of quiz questions and I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, ask you one question and whoever is the first person to uh, answer that uh, is going to uh, win this book. And uh, uh, along with this, you're also going to get an autograph from uh, the author. Uh, Vishal. So, uh, you know, so, uh, and by the way, this is, uh, you know, uh, let's, uh, we always believe in the honor system. So, uh, I mean, uh, you can Google if you want to, but probably someone else who will not spend the time Googling will come up with the correct answer. So, uh, this is the first question. In 1951, on a cold January Saturday morning, a young Columbia University student has a chance meeting with someone for the first time. That meeting went down as a very significant event in the annals of investing history. This young student wanted to learn everything he possibly could about a company called the Government Employees Insurance. He never heard anything about the company even a week before that meeting. The person who he was meeting was at that time the vice president of finance of that company and subsequently became the CEO of that company. The meeting lasted for four hours and the VP kept answering questions from this student. The student had gone ahead and purchased that stock of that company the following Monday after that meeting, investing 65% of his net worth. 56 years later, that same student of course, he was not a student any longer, bought the entire remaining shares of the same company from the same person he had met in 1951. And that person was, uh, you know, at this time, age 97. Now, this became one of the most historic long-term investment track records in a single business. Of course, the business, uh, you know, was no longer uh, listed. So, the Question to you is, there are three questions. Who was this Columbia University student? What is the name of that company? The name subsequently changed. So what is the current name of that company? And who was the person that this student met? So whoever comes up with all the three correct answers will. Okay. Fanlian, can you keep an eye to see if someone has given all the three correct answers? I mean, I can I can see yeah. a lot of. I think someone, yeah, Fan Vishaga got it first. I think, yeah. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, yep. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. 
Vis Sagar Gore. Yeah, he's the first person to get it. Uh, the student was Warren Buffett. The company is right now known as Geico, owned by uh, Berkshire. And uh, the person he was meeting was uh, Lorimer Davidson, uh, Dave. So uh, they subsequently became you know, very good friends. And Buffett uh, bought a huge chunk of uh, Geico. Uh, initially, I think he uh, paid, as part of Berkshire, he paid a couple of million. And subsequently in uh, 96, that is 50, yeah, about 56 years after that meeting, he bought the rest. And this time he paid uh, for the remaining uh, portion, he paid over uh, two and a half billion dollars. I think uh, somewhat from two and a half billion dollars. Yeah. So, okay. So, uh, Mr. Gore, we will get in touch. Fan Liang, if you can just uh, private message him and get his address. So, we will arrange to send you uh, the book. And uh, so, now let's start the panel discussion. And uh, hold on, we will have, uh, you know, more questions later. Uh, so, this was a fantastic presentation and uh, you know it, it really opens our eyes what a long-term focus can do and how we can benefit by just keeping out the noise so my first question goes to one of the panelists uh, fan liang he is uh, my business partner now uh, fan liang you spend a lot of time analyzing businesses and uh, i know it requires huge amount of focus because you know, you read literally thousands and thousands of pages for any business, you know, all the 10 Ks, you listen to them. So how do you keep your noise out? And uh, I, I, after this, uh, you know, I would uh, also like uh, Vaibhav and Vishal to uh, tell us that in your personal life, how do you manage to keep keep the noise out? Fanya. Yep, Rupan, great question. And, and before I answer, I just want to say, uh, Vishal, great presentation just now. I've heard you two times, first in 2018, and then second time in 2019, live then physically. And then this time again, it's amazing presentation. So thank you very much for, for that. Every time I hear from you, I, I listen I, I listen and learn, learn, learn new stuff. So now coming back to the, to the very apt question on how do we keep up noise? Again, I'll, I'll borrow one quote that Richard just shared with us early on in the presentation where it's a quote by Adam Smith, where he says, this, if if you want to find out who you are, the stock market is, is, the, is the, if you do know who you are, then the stock market is one where you'll pay a lot of price and to, to find out. So why, why this quote is because I think a lot of time there are so much noise out there, but if you are very clear about your investment philosophy, you are very clear about what you want, what is noise, what is not noise, and then why isn't the noise noise, then it makes it very, or, or at least easier to be not affected by those noise. So this is a bit abstract. So I'll share with you how I personally look at investment. And, and this is what we at what Money Wise Smart do too. So we focus on buying great companies and we want to own them like a business owner. So this is the first point. And then we want to own them for long and let the long-term compounding tax effect. Just like how we see just now that net wealth of Warren Buffett, how you just compound and then like how and the lady compound her wealth. And the last point is, is also, I, I really believe in Benjamin Graham's words so many decades ago that the stock market in the short run is a, vote, is a weight voting machine. And then in the long run is a waving machine. So, so with these three points, I will now share how, how does it actually apply to us to try to reduce the noise. So on the first two points about buying into good businesses and wanting to own them for long. If this is how we think about our investments philosophy and how we want to actually make money from the market, then we should act accordingly to it. That means that all our time should be focused on spending, on trying to understand the business because then that's aligned with our investment philosophy. We, we can't go into the market saying we want to own them long-term and then later on we go and look at short-term market news, short-term news about the company, look at the market prices all day long. And then these two become so inconsistent. So if you are very strong about your investment philosophy and why, why certain things are noise, then I think it will make it easier where we, I would rather focus on reading annual reports, following the company's operate, operating performance, 
and then also reading the super text like what Risha has mentioned just now, there's a spectrum of things that we can choose to read and not. And in, in fact, when I first started out investing, I was reading a lot of the things on the left side on that spectrum, which is news. I, I signed up for business news, I, I paid for it. And then I signed up for two magazines, including The Economist. And then back then I was, I was early into my investing journey. I was, I was so eager to read those. But at the end of the day, I, after one week, every week I would think back, what, what have I actually learned from them? Does any of those information really materially affect the long-term prospect of a business? I mean, if they might affect the short-term business performance, but I mean, or any, anything can happen to a business and in this world, anytime. So, so there's, if my investment philosophy is not to try to make money from short-term price movement, then I have no business with those information. And, and that's where I, I started reading Vishar's article about this super tax. And, and really after that, I, I stopped my subscription and then I just focus on books and super tax and company filings, et cetera. And then the next point is thinking about ourselves as a long-term business owner might sound easy, but actually I think there are a few stages of such thinking and it will evolve for everyone as time passes and your the evolution will be different. I'll just share one example with all of you that's a few years back, I, I, I thought I already got it. I thought I have the psychology of a long-term business owner until one day and I read Warren Buffett's letters and, and I realized that I'm completely wrong. And what I mean by this is back then, I, I used to like to call myself an equity analyst. So when people ask me, oh, what do you do? Or I say, I analyze equity. But then Warren Buffett actually says in his letter that, no, we are not equity analysts. We are business analysts. I think this, this, even though to many sounds like just a small point, I mean, it's just a terminology, it's a nuance. But to me, I think it actually means a lot. Like if I'm focused on the long-term business performance, why am I calling myself an equity analyst? I'm actually analyzing the business. I should, work, I should completely forget that this company is publicly traded, that is completely a private business. That's how I should look at it as a business owner. And once I become clearer in such thinking, it actually aligns me to, to help me focus on the more important things and block out these noises. And the second part in Warren Buffett's letters is relating to my point last, my third point at the beginning about my investment philosophy that I believe in Benjamin Graham's words that market in the short term is a voting machine in the long run is a waving machine where if you believe so, and if you want to profit from long term, that means what makes you money is really just about the company's business operating performance. It doesn't matter where, doesn't matter where the share price goes because you think that in the, in the end, the value will converge to where, near where the, the, sorry, the price will converge to where the value is. And once we realize this, the way we look at our portfolio will be probably very different. So I have a question for everyone and, and you, you do need to answer me. You can just think about it. When people ask you, how is, what is your portfolio performance now? How is your portfolio, portfolio performance? I'm, I'm sure a lot of people will say, oh, it's how many percent or like 200% over the past three years. But is that really the thing we want to measure our, our portfolio on? If we are long-term business owners, then we should just measure it according to the intrinsic value of the business at any point of time. The market price, the portfolio returns based on market price just have no meaning at all unless it's a super long-term period. And once you start thinking like this, when you track your portfolio return by thinking about the business intrinsic value, then you start only tracking about its operating performance. You, you totally forget about share price. And then this, if you start thinking about along these terms, then hopefully it'll help you to forget that share price matter and also forget about all the short-term things that can affect this company because if it doesn't affect the company's long-term prospect. These are just passings, short-term passings. I mean, in, in life, we have so much of this that we can't focus on them. And I would say probably lastly, those are quite strategic points. If we come to more tactical points, I would say, if you don't want to be affected by noise, then, then stay away from the noise. So out of sight, out of mind, like if you always look at market news on your phone, you have a market news app, you have Yahoo Finance, you have a, a brokerage account app on your mobile, then either delete them or, or just move them, hide them in some folder where it's not on the on the first page of your homepage. Because when you're bored, you, you take out your phone and then you, you see the that app, then probably you're clicking to see, oh, what's the latest news about this company? 
but you don't really need to like like Bisha has mentioned in his presentation you can just sign up for uh, google alerts for your companies so if there are any important news it will either come from google news or it will come from the company's investor relations where if they have an important announcement then they'll tell you and probably last thing interestingly recently or uh, just a story about myself i i lost my phone my my phone was broken mobile phone, so I send it to repair. And then for interactive, I use interactive brokerage. So I usually just do all my transactions on my uh, mobile app. That means, and the security is tied to that phone. And I, I don't know how long that phone is going to be repaired. That means I, I lose access to my brokerage. And, and I have no idea how long would it take because it's under warranty. And then like, I just have no idea. But, but when I think about it, so, so, so how do I think about it? It's like, I can't access my brokerage for I don't know how long a period. Does it matter? No, my life still goes on. Like my life is not going to change because of this. I have already set up my portfolio to be able to, to run it as a long-term portfolio. So it doesn't matter. So I think one, one exercise that I would encourage all of you to think about is if you have issues with trying being affected by these noises, why not set up your portfolio properly? Um, make sure that the orders you put in are orders that you really want. Then delete the brokerage app or set a password that only your, your close family members know that they, they, they can't tell you until it's really emergency or just delete all the apps for, for say uh, one month and then see what happens, how you feel about it. Like, can you, can you tolerate these kind of situations and then spend those times and go and focus on the more important stuff if you're, that is aligned with your investment philosophy by reading company every report or, or go to Vishas website. There are so many great articles you can go back. I think he started maybe, I think 10 years ago, if I'm wrong, Vishas, please correct me. Like just go through every single article, I'm sure you will benefit so much more than just focusing on short-term things. So I think those are a few things that I, I focus on. And I think really that clarity of mind on what's your investment philosophy has helped me to, to try to keep out all these noises. Let me ask Vishal, I mean, uh, Vishal, how did this whole philosophy start? You know, uh, different people, uh, you know, start uh, for different reasons. I mean, everybody invests money or at least everybody uh, thinks that they invest money. So uh, did you have any mentor? Did you start with this philosophy right from the beginning or like anyone else at one point of time, you were also short term focused and somehow this evolved. Tell us the story. We are very keen to know. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think uh, luck had a huge role to play right? because uh, when I was uh, graduating uh, out of my MBA college, I think uh, that was 2003. And uh, the world was just uh, coming out of the 2000 uh, dot com bust and the uh, recession out there. Uh, and there were not many jobs available. So uh, I wanted to get into foreign exchange uh, uh, trading uh, and investment research. But uh, the only job that came to my hand was independent equity research analyst. And, uh, uh, in hindsight, that uh, seemed like a seems like a huge lucky break for me because uh, uh, if it was not that kind of a job which I got in, in terms of doing an independent research, long term research in companies, I would have come to know about, or especially like I would have read much deeper about Buffett and Munger and the likes. Right, so uh, I think a huge amount of luck uh, uh, that helped me get into this industry. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, that I started with independent research. That was my first and last job for eight years, uh, analyzing companies from, from a long-term perspective. That gave me a lot of time. And not really uh, uh, chasing fund managers with my ideas, right? Uh, researching long-term. So that gave me a lot of time to read about uh, uh, the philosophy of Buffett Munger and how to apply that to Indian markets. So uh, I think uh, it's a matter of luck and of course uh, uh, the right timing uh, as well because 2003 was when uh, we were just getting into the uh, uh, one of the best bull markets at India probably the world has seen 2003 2008 right that was the time that uh, where I was actually learning the ropes of value investing uh, how how actually value uh, can really work for people over a long period of time that was of course just a five six year period but then I think the lessons got ingrained at that point of time. Um, and that is the reason I, I never actually started with the short term mentality. I've always been draw loss hours, right? I have uh, uh, I have taken risks in life as well. Uh, and for example, the biggest risk I took was to was to leave my job uh, and to start Sakal Nivesha without any idea about how am I going to survive financially. Uh, uh, but I think uh, I am loss hours. Uh, uh, 
like like a lot of people are right so uh, i think uh, not taking a risk that can destroy you financially uh, i think has helped the lessons of buffett and munger have helped and i think the most important thing or the most important that has really helped me is to learn to say no very often right so no to bad businesses no to noise news uh, uh, i think uh, if you ask me like what are my stocks doing as of now to be very honest with you i have no clue right i may look at my stocks once in a month or or if i remember uh, to, to take out time out of my work and my family i may look out my stocks but i think they are doing reasonably well because uh, as i mentioned the most important thing that you can do as an investor is to make decisions that can stand the test of time right uh, whether you are making a bad uh, you you making a bad return on a stock or a great return on a stock i think the mistake uh, the, the mistakes that we make are not really uh, uh, when we lose a lot of money the mistakes are made on the day we made the decision in the same way uh, outcomes uh, that are good outcomes that can help us create wealth are based on the decisions that we took maybe 5 years 10 years back so if you can ensure that the decisions are well taken if you can ensure and you can be humble enough to understand that you don't understand a lot of things and you as as uh, buffett says that you, you focus on uh, uh, not crossing that boundary of your circle of competence saying no to a lot of things because most things are there we need to understand and appreciate and accept that we don't understand right so uh, if you do all that and learn to say no i think you'll be in safe territory it's not about doing more and more and more as i said it's doing about less and less and less and i think that's that's the way to do well that's that's something as which has really worked well for me over so many years that's amazing amazing insight and funly uh, thanks i mean uh, you know uh, again great uh, insight now you know this group this community it's, it's mostly community of uh, value investors and we have as as you saw from you know the first poll uh, that uh, you know majority of the people they think of uh, medium to long term at least uh, you know definitely the holding period was higher than the overall uh, average however you know i wanted to ask uh, vaiva uh, my other business partner he comes from a completely uh, you know uh, the other end of the spectrum uh, so vaiva has uh, uh, you know been with citibank he uh, you know he has been a very uh, successful trader you know making uh, millions of dollars there but vaiva what happened for you how come you made the shift towards uh, you know long term investing and and now you know we speak exactly the same language so tell us your story so i think if i speak for myself uh, uh, i got interested in stocks from a very early on probably we went to the same uh, uh, college or engineering institute and uh, uh, right around those times i used to look at those in india at that time they used to of uh, the ipo forms you have to fill up a form and attach a demand draft and you get shares in an ipo and so on and i used to apply them and many of them would be uh, over subscribed so i would not get an allocation and so on so i started learning about stocks and i had this uh, uh, mindset of valuing companies right from the beginning but as i went into my career and in citibank we were running the largest uh, warrants and equity derivative desk here and those trading rooms are what you see in the movies with every trader with four or five screens there are tvs running all over the place there is a lot of noise most of them are males a lot of uh, banging on the tables and screaming going on and so on. and those things uh, if you see uh, they they fill some sort of a vacuum they they show you that there is a lot of activity going on. and uh, just for that purpose uh, that there is some you are doing something whether whether you are like digging a hole and filling it back again but you are still doing something and that's what i found the trading to be so when i uh, with the knowledge of value investing when i started uh, trading uh, even futures and uh, forex and commodities and so on the whole whole act was that you are constantly involved you are constantly running on a treadmill but once after let's say a couple of years or so and you uh, i made some money as well but when you look back uh, you realize that uh, that your uh, dollars per hour or the time value of money or the amount of time you invested and what you get back and all the related stress with it that's 
probably not worth it that somewhere comes out to around uh, the, the the minimum wage sort of level rather than spectacular returns because you are pick, you don't get good sleep you are watching the japan open sometimes you are watching a statement from federal reserve one day and so on so those things once you once i look back and then in uk we have a Uh, another sort of account called ISR, which is an investment uh, uh, individual saving account, and I realized that my that investment account has done more than my trading account. Simply because my investment account, okay, I bought something here and there uh, with some research, and I left it there because all my time was focused on my trading. And then I say, why am I investing so much energy into something which is producing lower return? then just uh, investing my time into research and, and analyzing the businesses and then leaving them to do their job and that's when some kind of thing uh, clicked so the study where i'm sitting right now in fact uh, i used to have two screens and then i would have a small laptop which would be feeding me the s&p 500 pit noise pit noise is like in chicago when they used to trade in the s&p pits Uh, there would be a, some guy who is constantly announcing the price of every S and P tick, and I would listen to that tick just to get the feel of the market. There would be a TV in front of me which would be mostly playing Bloomberg or uh, CNBC. The first thing I did was I got rid of the TV that I don't need that constant news in my face the whole time. Then I shut that pit, and anyway the pits got shut eventually because of Corona. But uh, at least. that noise the pit noise i stopped it i moved to a single screen because i don't need to occupy such a big space in my study and now uh, even though i'm sitting during the market open and uh, and i'm aware of what's going on most of the time i'm either reading an annual report or some 10k or so on or uh, mostly discussing some of the companies which we are uh, researching in our multibagger research series and so on and that still gives me much higher return than trying to watch every tick in the market and trying to take positions against them so what i have compromised or what i have just given up is this hyperactivity that i don't need to be constantly in a fight with something and i have come to this calmer state of uh, uh, almost meditation that where you don't have to react to every single stimulus I mean, of course, we do watch the prices and we do act to. When the 10K comes out, we read it. But it's not uh, that when somebody on CNBC announces something, and we have to immediately jump to our computer and put some orders in. And that was uh, that's a way of cleaning out the clutter from my own noise. And I could suddenly found that uh, I can do it a lot better. I could get more uh, returns out of it. and uh, my interactions are also a lot more intellectual now rather than uh, the macho fighting situation which you find typically in a traders uh, chat rooms It's, now we, we have a much more sensible and uh, intellectual discussions rather than uh, uh, punching each other or killing the brokers or killing the hedge funds and so on that's amazing that's amazing so uh, so vishal i uh, i know you have uh, kids may i ask you how how old are your children are they uh, teenagers <laughs> so uh, uh, my daughter is uh, 16 and my son is 9 and a half okay so uh, you know and uh, so that you know on uh, in this group uh, right now there are actually uh, a, a few teenagers you know uh, my son is uh, attending my wife's uh sun is there and there were quite a few very young uh, investors now uh, you know as we all know uh, that uh, the long term uh, investing the long term compounding i mean if it starts early uh, in life you know that's that's even better so uh, so uh, can you you know what's your message to these young people i mean because you know nowadays you know there are lots of distraction you know social media and you can't really blame them so what might be easier for us because we have seen that we have seen the effects it it's very difficult for you know uh, the 16 year old or the 13 year old or the 18 year old so what's your message how should they go about uh, investing <laughs> so i think uh, uh, a lesson i think again uh, uh, which i have learned over years is that uh, 
uh, people talk about delayed gratification and <laughs> people talk about teaching kids uh, delayed gratification i think but uh, often people take it too far right kids uh, in their growing up years if you try to teach a lot of delayed gratification and not to enjoy the present i think you are doing them a disservice so uh, uh, I, i'm sure people have learned heard about the story of the marshmallow test experiment which, which was done on kids many years back i think it was done by a stanford stanford professor in the 1960s or 70s so kids uh, i think as young as 5 years 6 years of age uh, uh, were uh, given a marshmallow and they were asked to sit in a room for 15 minutes and if uh, they did not eat that marshmallow in 15 minutes they were offered a second one right and of course if they ate it they were not offered the second one so they were testing the patience levels and the delaying gratification uh, of these kids and as they tracked the uh, life of these kids over the next 30 40 years they they found the experimenters found that the, the kids who actually deferred gratification by not eating that first marshmallow and could wait for 15 minutes did really well as far as their uh, scores were concerned in school college uh, as far as their general level of happiness and the job satisfaction etc was confirmed so they arrived at this conclusion this is there's a book called the marshmallow experiment that uh, if you can learn to delay gratification early on i think you would generally be happy and do better in your life in your work and everything which is a good uh, way to look at things but uh, i would also uh, uh, i would i think add a thing to it that if you have 10 marshmallows for now for example if you have 10 marshmallow you should be saving five or six for the future but you should be having four or five now as well. <laughs> right so uh, 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 teaching kids the importance of saving and investing for the future i think should start early on and uh, the way to teach them is not to tell them what to do and what is right and what is what is wrong but to show them how it is done right they buffet sees says that and and there's a very nice series uh, i'm sure people know that uh, uh, warren buffet has a very nice animation series um, i for, i forget the name of that series but he has a very nice video series uh, 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 teaching kids about uh, investing businesses Uh, I think Secret Millionaires Club. I recollect the name. Secret. Is it Millionaire. on YouTube? It's on YouTube. It, there's also a website uh, where he has all the videos. They are short videos, animated, and the voiceover is by Warren Buffett himself, right? Uh, and he teaches every video teaches about uh, 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 investing, businesses, dealing, gratification, saving, and all those kind of things, which is a nice introduction to kids about how uh, the best investor in the world thinks. But I think. the biggest lesson comes from uh, within the family of people they see every day which is you right and your spouse and and teachers and if we can show them how uh, we can delay gratification i think we don't need to force this lesson onto them they are smart enough and today's generation i think every generation is smarter than the previous one so uh, i think uh, that's a way to do it to show them and not to overdo it not to overdo it so that's that is something which advice. i do well with my kids as well now uh, how they do in the future is not something which is in my control but the point is all i have to do is to uh, do my responsibility as a parent to the best i can that's it that's fantastic advice uh, vishal okay so uh, i think it's time for a couple of audience questions so we have a raised hand uh, ashish kaushal uh, you want to unmute yourself and ask your question i think that might be easier Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Uh, so, so first of all, thank you, thank you, host, more money wise, smart team, and also Vishal. It's it's Saturday evening, um, so thank you to your families as well for sparing you for sharing some knowledge with us. My my question was really something which I have struggled with over many years. You know, a lot of advice I get is if you if you want to put some money aside for speculation, set aside five ten percent of your portfolio. something that you can afford to lose over time you know and that way you can speculate in stocks and keep your investing money separate and and going through your presentation vishal i was wondering if if that is a sensible advice because trading and investing are kind of completely different uh, are on completely different opposite spectrums of of making money right and i was just wondering whether whether there is a risk of actually learning long wrong lessons by following this advice of you know dabbling a bit in in markets or you know putting some short term trading positions so so would love to hear your thoughts about about this kind of advice that that keeps floating around from people so i have uh, uh, so i'll uh, answer the question actually first i think uh, 
I have not really, uh, while I have talked about this thing as well in the past, uh, when people have asked me about uh, indulging in some kind of trading apart from uh, investing, because human nature is human nature, right? And uh, the, the, the need to speculate, the need to uh, use the reflexive brain more and more, right? Uh, I think is there inherently in all of us. So uh, uh, I'm not really sure about that 5% or 10% kind of a thing. But, uh, and I don't do it personally myself, but I think uh, 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 if I were to advise someone uh, uh, to actually, and his, uh, someone actually wants to uh, separate that, segregate that, I would simply say that uh, don't do th some things that can uh, destroy even that 5%, right? If I were to do uh, practice that 5% and 95% with my own portfolio, I would rather uh, uh, practice 95% uh, investing into core businesses or businesses that I don't want to sell ever, right? Forever. And the remaining 5%, I would use the same process, but I may, I may dilute my process for that 5% a bit in terms of uh, uh, buying stocks first of businesses that I think can have a huge potential and then probably digging in deeper, right? Or, or maybe cloning an investor whom I respect a lot, right? So uh, also practicing the same kind of process that I do for the 95% of my buy wealth by probably diluting it a bit by taking a bigger risk with that kind of money, uh, it's difficult to separate those kind of thinking because, as 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 you said rightly, that they are uh, they're two different kind of mindsets. But it's still better than uh, trading and speculating that five percent because that's completely off uh, the kind of person you are. Right, uh, your temperament, your personality should drive what kind of investor you are. Uh, initially, I advise people, people who are starting out, they if they want to try out different kind of things, they want to try out derivatives, options, they want to try, it, try out anything, right? Short-term uh, trading, speculation, uh, long-term investing, people should do that, right? But over a period of time, I think it's very important to settle with what you are as a person, right? Uh, so that 5%, 95%, I think can be at the start of a career. A lot of people have or probably suffer from the risk of taking that 5% too far. That increases to 10% and 15% and then takes over the entire portfolio. But uh, I think if you can uh, have that kind of a, uh, a personality where you can mix both of them uh, by diluting your process a bit for that 5%, not completely, I think it still makes sense because uh, human nature, I think, has the instinct of speculate. To rather, rather than uh, uh, ruining your entire 95% portfolio by speculating, I would rather say you, you actually by your human nature by getting with this five plus test that was not the money so great that's i think i should great perspective okay the next uh question is from uh nick chion nick you there nick if you can unmute yourself uh to ask okay uh Maybe we lost him. So we uh, move to uh, Sahil Patel. Sahil, you there? I can see your raised hand. Okay, Sahil actually has put the question on chat. He's saying, Vishal sir, knowing all of uh, these things, do you still make mistakes? If yes, then how do you go through the uh, process to overcome these mistakes? This is actually a great uh, question, Vishal. I think uh, every investment decision that you make, we are all humans and we are investing is all about future, right? So, uh, and we are all playing with probabilities. So it's, there's no certainty. Even if you are a value investor, if you have made the best decision and you are the best thinker out there, be it with Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, Howard Marks, or anyone, take out any uh, good investor you have, they have all made mistakes and we are, we are like lesser models, right? So yes, uh, I make mistakes as now as well. But the way to reduce those mistakes is to reduce the number of decisions that you make, right? If you make lesser number of decisions, you are going to make lesser number of mistakes, right? Uh, uh, it's not about uh, trying to reduce mistakes and, and to reduce mistakes, you are making lesser number of decisions. But the fact is that if you, if you, if you follow that process that I talked about, if you say no to a lot of things because you uh, are humble enough to understand and appreciate and accept that you don't understand so many things, I think you're going to reduce a lot of mistakes, especially of commission, right? You may uh, miss out on a lot of businesses which may not show on your p &L, but I think uh, uh, that's still better off than losing real money, right? Which which can really uh, uh, prove, prove disastrous over a long period of time. 
So yes, I make mistakes. Uh, I try not to repeat the same kind of mistakes. Uh, right? Uh, uh, I have a written down uh, investment uh, process which I try to follow, not dilute it. But uh, I think minimizing the number of mistakes that I have made in the past and not repeating the same mistake is my goal now. And that has helped me. What has helped me is to minimize the number of decisions that I take. So I take very. I make maybe two or three decisions. And since most often I don't sell stocks. So one decision is always taken care of. When I say I don't sell stocks, it doesn't mean I adamantly hold on to businesses. When I say I don't sell stocks, it means that I, I am very careful when I'm buying stocks so that I don't have the need to sell except when I need the money. But uh, of course, if things go wrong, I would have to sell the stock, accept my mistake and move on. But the point is that uh, uh, I have not really, I've been lucky enough to not be in a position like that for the past few years at least where I have to sell stocks because it turned out to be a mistake. I've only stock, sold stocks in the past 10 years because I needed the money, but never uh, uh, when I realized that it was a mistake. It happened before that, but especially in the last 10 years after I started on my own, I don't remember a situation where I sold stocks. So that important decision has been taken care of. As far as buying is concerned, I try to make minimum number of decisions that helps me minimize my mistakes. Fantastic. That's that's a great answer. You know, I mean, uh, I would like to uh, provide a perspective here. You know, when uh, when we are thinking really long term, and when you know our return is is not predicated on you know the short term movement of stock price, but the long term compounding, uh, it's actually that whole framework is actually uh, fairly forgiving to mistakes. And uh, what will happen more often is okay i mean there are times when you know uh, you know there's a it's a black and white uh, you know let's say you have invested in a stock and uh, you realize that it turns out to be a fraud let's say you know wirecard or uh, so. so that's a clearly black and white uh, decision and uh, you know it it might happen from time to time so that's where you know the portfolio allocation and all those things come in and you know we we move on but I think more often what happens is the gray area. Maybe a business for a, a period of time may not be performing. Uh, and when I say performing, I'm not talking about the stock price movement. We always think in terms of the operating business as well as we anticipated. Now, the beauty of compounding is that, you know, uh, over the years, the, the weightage of this underperforming business, I mean, if we just leave it uh, alone, it automatically reduces. So that itself has an effect of, uh, you know, reducing the uh, weightage of that mistake because the ones which are performing, you know, they compound at a higher rate and they become a larger and larger percentage of the portfolio. And it, it can happen that, uh, you know, after a couple of years, suddenly you know, the management gets their act together and again, this business starts uh, uh, performing. So, uh, and, and this is a process which even, uh, you know, uh, Buffett and Munger, they follow in uh, uh, Berkshire Hathaway. And uh, here, as Vishal, you rightly say, that making lesser number of decisions is actually the smarter thing to do because, you know, the the base rate of human decision-making, the, uh, the probability, I mean, you know, the track record is, is not great when it comes to, uh, you know, that, that active uh, buying and selling. So uh, I think... Uh, I personally feel that it's much better off leaving uh, leaving that uh, decision making to time, which actually is uh, you know the the superman in in this because it sits in the exponent of the compounding formula and often it auto corrects the the portfolio. So that's how I I look at the uh, gray area sometimes. Okay, so we have uh, another question from Ishan, Ishan Shukla. Uh, please oh, unmute yourself and go ahead, uh, Ishan. Yeah, firstly, thanks for the talk. It's really useful. Uh, my main question is, uh, when you think about businesses to buy, um, what uh, do you think about, uh, for example, the ethics behind the business? And or is it just about how much money a certain business can make like is or or is it more holistic approach of 
thinking about maybe these this business or management might be quite cruel for example or be doing doing bad things to make money but then uh yeah for example in that kind of way do you do you focus your investing on trying to you know make yeah make a difference towards the world or is it just uh focus on the profits only Palyan, would you uh, like to take this question because uh, you know you spend a lot of time uh, going through uh, lists of businesses to then uh, pick which one to do uh, a deep dive research on. So uh, why don't you explain uh, the, the overview of the process that you follow? Yep, I think that's a good, great question, Ishan, and and I'll just share what I have, and then uh, Visha, you can definitely happy to add on. I'm sure you have more experience in, in this area too, that you have more stories to share. So for, for me personally, I think it, it this is a really personal or subjective question, I think. And everyone has a different view. It really depends on what's, what's your life principle or life values, I would say. <clears throat> and, and for me personally, I think it, everyone has different tolerance for different things. Like, for example, if it's a sick, I mean, we all know the, some of the sin stocks, for example, like cigarettes, some people might not want to be in the tobacco industry. Some people might not want to be in the alcohol industry or some people might not want to invest in gambling or if, if it, for certain farming, if companies are not doing sustainable farming, then people might want to stay out. So depending on your own cost, you, you might want to stay away from some. And I think the other point to consider is also, if we look at it from an industry perspective, like say, take for example, gambling. If we don't invest in a gambling company, would the company still be there? Then yes. And then, but within this industry, I mean, human nature won't change. People are still gamble all the time. But within this industry, there are potentially companies that will try to be more sustainable, where they try to reduce the, the profits that they take. So in gambling industry, there's this, term called a uh, return to player, where say if you bet $100 over the over the long run, the casino will definitely make money. So the if the return to player RTP is 90, 90, uh, 98, that means the player will get $98 and then the casino will get $2. So the casino always win $2 out from the, the $100 bet. And then they are leading players in this industry, they are solving inefficiency problem where they can still be very profit profitable while increasing the RTP. So overall, it feels that the industry is bad, but some companies can be doing certain practices that actually try, try to make the industry less bad because they are solving inefficiencies in, in different areas. So my, the, to answer your question, there are certain industries that we are, I would definitely want to invest in. For example, like tobacco, I, I don't smoke, so I, I personally, it is a personal subjective view. But for certain other industries where I'm in the sort of in the middle, I will look at whether the company is doing sustainable practices within that industry itself. Vishal, what's, what's your perspective on the I ethical think, uh, part of investing? No, I think, uh, as I think uh, what I understand from Ishan, Ishan's questions, I think uh, is, are, as investors, are we focused only on the profits of business I'm making, or also looking at the ethics part, uh, maybe management quality or management managers are doing something wrong, right? The business is maybe as as you use the word immoral, like uh, alcohol or cigarettes or, or or sim businesses, kind of stuff, casinos. If if you were to uh, think that that those are sim businesses, but I think uh, uh, my my answer would be that uh, I think that's a non-negotiable management quality, and uh, 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 if they're doing some uh, whatever they are doing, right, uh, 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 with their business with stakeholders is non-negotiable. You if you are if you are trying to be a long term investor i think uh, you have to focus on the right managers or the right people whom you can associate with uh, because i i remember uh, 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 there's so many experiences that uh, uh, most investors would have uh, have have had in their investment experience like even i have i've seen managers who have uh, just run away with money and uh, uh, luckily i didn't lose out on those businesses lose out a lot of money but the point is that uh, Business is important, but so are the managers, right? And uh, as I think Thomas Fels uh, wrote in this book, 100 to 1, a very uh, critical, very important statement that we must all remember 
he said that it's very important to associate with good people because uh, if you're associating with bad people, right, uh, currently they may be stealing for you. In the future, they're going to steal from you, right? So uh, uh, they may be doing all the wrong things and still earning a lot of profits and you're enjoying their shareholder returns. But in the future, those guys are going to turn to you and I think looting uh, away your shareholders' wealth, your wealth that you created from that business. So I think I would not associate with business only for the sake of profits that they're generating. I would, I would be much more happier with, uh, of course, a business being good, not in a bad industry, uh, uh, and of course, very important, uh, in the right hands, run by the right kind of people, who are owners, who are not just operators, who are owners. So I think that's that's my, my response. I think I'm not sure if I've answered each other's questions here. Why were would uh, would you have a perspective? Let's say I mean uh, you know I know people have hangups that oh I don't want to invest in the tobacco industry or the you know uh, alcohol industry. I know you you yourself you uh, produce wine. I mean you know Vaiva actually you know grows grapes and he uh, he he produces his own wine. So so what's what's your perspective on, on that? I don't consider wine as sin. <laughs> But uh, the, I think, yeah, jokes apart, I think the main uh, point is here is uh, uh, the two things which have started happening. One is nowadays the brokers have started uh, the ESG rating. So at least people can make their own decisions. Now, whether you subscribe to this or not is entirely your doing. But at least the information is out there. What is the ESG rating of the company? Whether they are doing something for the environment, for the society and things like that. So those ratings are available and then uh, people can either ignore them or they can use them to model the portfolio. In fact, Interactive Broker nowadays, uh, you can actually get a score of your portfolio based on the ESG rating. So then you can see an idea where do you fit. Personally for me, uh, I don't go too much into business which I personally can't align with. Uh, so. And that goes into not only ethical or non-ethical. If, if I can, if I don't understand the business, then I don't go into it. And therefore, if uh, I don't understand the tobacco business, for example, I don't know. Like whenever I think of tobacco, I would think they should that business should go down because people will actually stop smoking over a long period of time. So I naturally do not get into it because I don't understand that business. Uh, same goes for, uh, let's say, uh, if there are, uh, uh, if the management is uh, not employee friendly, where generally the companies which I have operated, I have operated in a very employee friendly way. So if I see labor exploitations and things like that, I naturally don't end up getting into this because I don't understand their model. Like when, when I look at their cost, I might up apply a premium to that cost because I think they are paying a lower cost by exploiting the labors and if they come into a real business they have to pay higher so it happens naturally i think that's why if i say if we get into looking into the business deeper by understanding their 10ks and understanding their annual reports naturally you will make a choice which is more aligned with your personal values so i don't want to prescribe a, a recipe that don't invest here and invest there it's just that make an informed decision based on the company's underlying underlying uh, business and, and by reading the company's material. Okay, fantastic. So I think this is time for our next quiz question. Uh, again, one more uh, book up for grab. Uh, okay, so here you have to do a bit of uh, calculation. So th this again has uh, two questions and uh, the winner will have to uh, answer both the questions correctly. So listen carefully. Uh, and I will also copy paste it in the, in the chat window. Now, question one is, there are two portfolios of starting capital of $10,000 invested for a 30 year period. A portfolio A, you generate a 16% return on the entire portfolio, that is uh, on the initial capital of $10,000 for 15 years, and followed by an 8% return on the portfolio for the next 15 years. And portfolio B generates a steady 12% return for the 
entire 30 years. So which one does better, A or B? So that is the question number one. And there is a question number two. So I will just uh, post the question number one in uh, the chat. So you take some time to think. Now, question number two is, and don't don't just give out uh, the answer to uh, question number one. Wait for the question number two because uh, they're actually related. Uh, question number two is two portfolios of starting capital, again of ten thousand dollars invested for a thirty year period. Portfolio C generates eight percent return on half of the portfolio. That is on the initial capital of five thousand dollars. Portfolio C generates a eight percent return for 30 years and for the balance half portfolio C generates 16 percent return for the 30 years whereas portfolio D generates a steady 12 percent return on the whole portfolio for 30 years just like the portfolio B in question question one so in this case which one does better your portfolio C or portfolio D so uh, I would like to uh, get the correct answer for both and let's see who finally can you just scroll through and see yep I'll, I'll i'll be checking that okay i think i think we, we got a we got a winner uh harry chong won it harry chong what is his answer yes answer was B and C. B and C. Okay, that's perfect. Yeah. Uh, so that is the correct answer. And, and there is there is a logic to it. And this is, uh, this is very, very related to Vishal's presentation and, and the topic for today. So let me let me just uh, explain now in, in case of, uh, okay, in question one, what's happening is, you're investing uh, the starting capital of $10,000 for the 30 year period. Now in portfolio A, and that is typically what happens with a lot of growth companies that you know they, they have a period of phenomenal growth, which is 16% return for the entire portfolio for 15 years. But after that, the growth, growth slows down to just 8%. Whereas you know here, we have just taken the arithmetic average of uh, 16 and eight, and in portfolio B, you're just getting that average 12% return for the entire period. Now here, portfolio B does better. And here the lesson is, is very simple that what is more important is the longevity of your growth than the uh, growth in itself. And as we uh, know that in the compounding formula, time sits on the exponent. So, uh, so that's the reason why it's very important to uh, you know, evaluate the, the growth runway, the total addressable market to you know, have a good understanding of the longevity of the growth. Now, in question two, what is happening is uh, between C and D, uh, now D gets a steady return of 12% for the entire 30 years. Whereas in C, half the portfolio is doing a lot worse, just getting an 8% return. Whereas the other half is getting a 16% return but portfolio C ends up significantly higher than portfolio D. I mean, $479,000 as compared to $299,000 for, uh, for D. And here, the principle that is uh, in play is, you know, uh, it's basically the, uh, and this is also a beauty of compounding that uh, the, more dispersed the returns are. I mean, I can, I can give you an example. Let's say instead of eight and 16%, if uh, the two halves generated returns of, let's say four and 20%, the overall return of the portfolio would be even higher. So, you know, uh, that goes to show that uh, you don't have to be right. And this is related to one of the questions, I think, uh, uh, Ashish asked that question. You don't have to be uh, right in all your choices as long as you find, you know, uh, some businesses, even if it means, you know, you're only partially right, but as long as you uh, 
stay invested for the entire period and let compounding work the the decisions which you you have uh, you know made a right decision your high quality businesses you know they compound to a very significant amount and they take care of the mistakes that are there in the portfolio so you know this is the mathematical implementation of basically the lessons which were hidden in, in vishal's uh, presentation so finally if you can you know take the details and we will uh, you know uh, yep send a book uh, to them so are there any other questions okay i see a hand from uh, mr nirmal kumar jain if you can please unmute yourself to ask your question yeah am i audible yes we can hear you loud and clear okay uh, yeah hi uh, i am a uh, no a long time fan of vishal's writing so you know i have been following him for almost last 5 uh, 6 years the way he you know uh, makes the complex topics uh, related to investing and psychology in a very very simple language so that you know even uh, a teenager can relate what is writing so you know being inspired by all these writings uh, for last so many years uh, you know uh, and i i belong to a small town in maharashtra called as talkaranji a very very small town uh and you know uh, i've been investing almost like 6 uh, 7 years so wanted to inculcate uh, what vishal writes into my kids so i have uh, two kids so one is uh, 16 now and the girl kid is 12 so uh, you know i just took them to vishal's uh, camp at bangalore called as camp uh, millionaire uh, where is conducted the camp in bangalore so i took my kids there uh, for a day uh, drove all the way down from isal kanji to bangalore almost you know 900 kilometers uh, they did the workshop we came back and the kind of impact that i see in my kids uh, now it's almost been i think almost 4 or 5 years they have done this camp uh, the impact has been huge so in the way they uh, they uh, take the decisions uh, or they probably you know uh, uh, help us in taking decisions uh so let me example uh, about you know so i was supposed to buy a new car uh, while driving back uh, from a tennis court when i picked up my son uh, so deshna my uh, the younger one was along with me so i just told them okay we had a you know a a a test drive of a car and i'm planning to buy that car so both of my kids you know really asked me a question that we already have two cars so do you think this buying this car is a want or a need so i was pleasantly surprised by the questions that <laughs> these two guys asked me uh, so i told them okay it's not a need per se it's a want for me uh, so both of them told me pop why don't you you know if you have so much of money why don't you just you know uh, give that money to us or probably invest that money in probably an fd or a, a, a good stock that you have studied so that made a huge impact on my on my way of thinking again uh, and i really you know uh, put off that plan of buying that car so that was you know after they took that workshop uh, which uh, they took at uh, bangalore so why i'm trying to uh, you know uh, tell all about this is you know uh, so uh, a kid uh, that time spurs was almost i think 11 years or 12 years and deshna was almost 8 9 years uh, so i would you know probably request vishal if Uh, a single day workshop can make such a huge impact in the lives of the kids at such an early age uh, i would really request him if we can you know have something for teenagers from you know 16 17 18 years uh, where i think it would it would really make a huge impact in their life and i i'm just taking this platform to thank him so much uh, because that has created a huge impact on my kids life and uh, i would really request him if you can you know just think of uh, some good content for uh, you know ch- kids aged 18 19 20 uh, uh, a very very big thank you vishal if vishal does that i will definitely be the first person in the queue to send uh, <laughs> send my kids so yeah i i totally uh, you know uh, second uh, nirmal kumar's uh, opinion i think that's a difficult uh... Difficult age group. I think uh, once you moved into the teenage years, you become a rebel. So uh, teaching uh, someone, uh, I think uh, the most difficult age group to teach someone the right things to do in life is between thirteen to eighteen, nineteen, because you want to change the world that time rather than someone advising you how to change the world for the better. 
so i think it's it's either like yeah, nirmal's uh, kids uh, i think uh, uh, they were good enough uh, before 13 when they came to my workshop right so uh, i'm sure that they are they are smart and they they are good that's the reason they uh, still remember the lesson uh, and nirmal you got lucky with your kids rather than me being absolutely, a, a absolutely. or 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 it's uh, just because they attended my workshop i would not say that but uh, the point is that i have been considering such kind of workshops in the past as well uh, especially the last one one and a half years but uh, having a teenage daughter at my home <laughs> pulls me back again and again as this is not the right age group to teach kids <laughs> what to do in life i think let them move beyond 2021 let them see some of the struggles in life uh, and i think probably that's a time to retrain them or retrain their mind if we if we are lucky so maybe we talk when your kids are 20 plus <laughs> fantastic fantastic okay we i think uh, we have uh, now you know it has gone on for quite some time we will just take one last question and i have uh, you know one hand from corner and uh, yeah corner please unmute yourself and ask your question yeah can you hear me yes we can yeah uh, just wanted to say thanks very much it's been absolutely brilliant um so thanks again uh, my question, so I'm, I'm young and over the next hopefully three to five years, my aim is to build a portfolio of companies that rock solid businesses that I really, really understand that I can hopefully ideally hold the rest of my life. Right now, opportunities might be hard, quite hard to come by and to act on. So what are some measures you've put in place, you know, both psychologically or whatever, that helps prevent you for this act to urge in the stock market and and then on top of that how is your time spent in situations like right now where opportunities might be quite hard to to find how do you spend your time most wisely um and what's your approach to like idea kind of generation and i and open this up to, to all panelists that i'd like to hear Visha, so how do you spend your time wisely and what's your process for idea generation <laughs> That is basically what Connor wants to know. Um, ideas come from anywhere and everywhere. So I, uh, I would not rather restrict uh, the source of ideas. I think if you keep putting time into the process, keep putting time into learning the right kind of things, move from ephemeral to enduring kind of reading, right? You will get ideas uh, uh, for investment uh, and for making better decisions. I'm sure automatically after a certain point of time, not initially, after a certain point of time. As far as spending time is concerned, as an investor, I think uh, as I see Connor, I think he seems pretty young. Uh, so uh, I'm happy that he is thinking about investing and thinking, asking the right kind of questions at his age. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, as 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 I think, uh, thinking thinking in terms of like this is the first lesson that Ben Graham also gave and Marshall Greenberg uh, shared that that thinking in terms of eternity. Zooming out rather than zooming in, zooming out of stuff, right? Looking at the bigger picture, right? And uh, 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 so focusing on what's enduring rather than the ups and downs and the tides here and there, I think is going to serve you well, Connor. I think reading the lessons from the super texts, which I've already written, reading Warren Buffett's letters, especially when it comes to investment thinking and decision making, reading uh, Poor Charlie's Almanac and these kind of super texts, not just once, again and again and again and again, so that these ideas actually are ingrained in your mind. And actually putting them into practice, right? That's these are the ways you are going to learn to make better decisions over a period of time, right? Uh, uh, you cannot have a and uh, since you are like I think starting uh, new and uh, like you have a lot of time period ahead of in front of you, uh, I think one of the important advice that I would give is to uh, believe in the power of patience. I think uh, it is very painful to be patient, especially when you are seeing people around you making a lot of money, especially youngsters. I think being patient and uh, giving time to the learning process, yeah, to your investing uh, uh, process, I think that is going to serve you really well over a period of time. So learn to say no. I think that's another thing. Right? I think a lot of things would come to you. A lot of businesses would come to you. Right? A lot of ideas would come to you. The more you read and research, the more number of ideas you're going to get, which is a very good thing. But uh, uh, be very selective in the kind of ideas, the kind of books, the kind of training resources that you get hooked to them and then once you find that those are ideas that you are that are worth looking at that you actually enjoy researching analyzing or reading i think just uh, be very serious with them and just disperse them i think over a long period of time i think you'll get what you want that's 
fantastic advice thanks a lot uh, vishal and uh, you know you have been extremely generous with your time uh, it was a real pleasure to have you and we definitely uh, learned uh, quite a lot so thank you so much and thanks everybody i know it's a saturday you had uh, other better things to do but uh, you know you have uh, showed your commitment so really appreciate uh, we really enjoyed uh, the session at least i definitely did and uh, you know we will uh, we will keep conducting sessions uh, like this this is how we we learn from uh, you know the the uh, wisdom of uh, others who have been doing this for a long time and uh, and the idea is to uh, become uh, better investors so thank you very much vishal thank you so much thank you so much for the thank invitation you. If you have enjoyed this video, please smash the like button below and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Do join us in our investment forum on Facebook using the link in the description below, where we discuss lots of interesting businesses and investing concepts. Do check out our multi-bagger research series at the link in the description below, where we discuss in detail great businesses to own and compound your wealth for the long term. These great businesses have high growth in revenue profits and free cash flows. For example, this global payments company has grown at a compounded annual growth rate or CAGR of 60 to 80 percent, while this technology company has grown its revenue at a CAGR of 80 percent. And this other payments company has grown its revenue and profits at a CAGR of 20 plus percent. Check out our comprehensive option series course on options strategies to complement long-term investing at link in the description below.